Medical procedures can be complicated, but one of the most complicated ones and more difficult to understand is called a transjugular intrahepatic orthosystemic shunt. Not only the name is complicated, but also the whole anatomy is challenging. But I'm gonna break down to you and explain why this is done, how it's done, and what to expect after the procedure. So TIPS, or transjugular intrahepatic part of systemic shunt, it's a shunt to relieve pressure in the veins in the liver. And it is a treatment option for patients with chronic liver disease. So chronic liver disease is a term that is a very general term, but it includes you know, a bucket of problems that may cause damage to the liver. And this is often caused by alcohol intake, but can also be caused by other processes like viral hepatitis, like hepatitis C or hepatitis B, or other conditions like hemochromatosis when you accumulate iron in your liver, it's a genetic disorder, or sometimes can be a secondary to an autoimmune disorder. That's when you produce antibodies against your liver cells that causes chronic damage of the liver. There are also multiple other rare conditions that can damage your liver and can cause chronic liver disease. And the thing is, often there is a combination of these processes. Let's say somebody that has a chronic hepatitis and then drinks alcohol on top of it or was born with hemochromatosis and drinks alcohol with. So somebody that probably just by drinking alcohol, they wouldn't damage the liver, but because they have another process that can happen. And the part of the stuff to understand is that the liver is actually a unique organ. It has a different perfusion than most of organs. Their blood vessels are a little different. For instance, if you have an organ like the brain or the kidney, Usually you have one blood vessel that is bringing the blood from the heart, taking the nutrients to the organ, it's called an artery, and it's just one. And then the artery comes and takes the blood flow to the organ. The blood runs through the organ, the organ absorbs the oxygen and the nutrients, and then it comes back to another vessel called a vein that will take the blood back to the heart so it can, again, be distributed. And it takes the blood flow back to the heart, which, again, can go back to the circulation. Because one of the liver functions is to clear the blood from toxins, often toxins that you ingest, the liver is an organ that is located in between. So what happens is when you eat something or ingest liquid or a medication, it gets absorbed to the small intestine and then it's being taken by a vein called the portal vein, who eventually is going to the heart, but before going to the heart, it feeds the liver. And so everything you ate gets filtered in the liver through the portal vein and then gets taken back to the heart through the hepatic veins. So when you have a chronic condition in the liver, a chronic liver disease, anything that we talked about before, that filter, which is the liver, gets kind of clogged, like it gets stiff and it's hard for the blood flow to go through. So this leads to a pressure buildup in the portal vein. And because the blood's having a hard time going to the liver, it causes two problems. One is that this blood's gonna try to go somewhere else and find new blood vessels to try to go back to the heart. And in this process, we'll form what's called varices. They can be in the esophagus or they can be in the stomach or they can be hemorrhoids. And these varices, because they have a high pressure, they tend to bleed. And this can be a big problem. And when they start bleeding, sometimes it can be very ugly and people can even end up dying from it. But the other problem is that when the pressure builds up, the fluid cannot go through the liver and gets stuck there and ends up extravasating into your abdominal cavity. And this leads to the formation of what's called ascites or peritoneal fluid or essentially fluid in the abdomen. You see, it's easier to visualize that somebody that, for example, in the leg, you have the veins bringing the blood flow back to the heart. If you develop a blood clot in that vein or any blockage of that vein, your leg is going to get swollen, right? And essentially, that's the same thing that is happening in the liver because that vein is essentially clogged because of the chronic liver disease. It forms swelling in the abdomen, which manifests by this fluid buildup. Essentially, some of the problems related to chronic liver disease are related to this increased pressure on the portal vein, also called portal hypertension, which leads to varices and, again, fluid in the abdomen. 
So there are different ways to mitigate the varices and the fluid in the abdomen. For example, the varices can be treated with a medication called a beta blocker that will decrease the pressure in the varices and decrease the chances of bleeding. Or they can also be treated with an endoscopy where they go in and kind of bend or ligate or clamp these varices. The fluid can be treated with diuretics that decreases the amount of fluid that you have in the abdomen. Or in some cases, we can go in and put a needle in the abdomen and remove this fluid. But of course, if this becomes a problem, we may need to do something else. And eventually, if your liver disease is super severe and you are a candidate, probably the best option would be a transplant. But again, not all patients are candidates for a transplant. And it's also a big surgery. So is there another option to mitigate the symptoms and improve the quality of life? And that's where the tips or transjugular intrahepatic shunt come in. Because that's essentially a shunt or I call it escape valve that we can create to relieve some of this portal pressure and resolve the symptoms and the problems related to it. So the TIPS is a communication between the portal vein and the hepatic vein. So if the pressure in the portal vein builds up, you can relieve the pressure by going through that shunt instead of having to go through the normal liver. And you should keep that in mind. And this is why the TIPS can work very well, but also that's the problem of the tips. And I'll explain that to you. So I told you before that one of the functions of the liver is to filter the blood from toxins. So you can imagine that if I create a large shunt that isn't bypassing the liver entirely, so nothing, no of the blood is going through the liver, these toxins are not gonna be clear because essentially you're just bypassing the liver, right? And now what would happen is you would accumulate these toxins in your body and you would become confused. And that's called hepatic encephalopathy. And if you have chronic liver disease, you may have heard about it. Often attributed to high ammonia levels, although it's not only the ammonia, it's like many other toxins, we just happen to measure the ammonia. And the treatment is also not easy. We usually treat with lactulose, we can cause diarrhea, and rifaximin, we can be expensive, but many patients are already taking those things. So essentially the tips works really well, but the problem is if you make a tips that is too big, you will over shunt or over treat, and that can lead to encephalopathy. And we'll talk more about that during this video. So how is a tips done? This is one of these procedures that kind of sound like magic, like, cause it's anatomically, it sounds impossible that you could do that. And that was, it took me a while during medical school to actually understand how does that work and how can that even be done? You see, in the past, people used to do surgery and kind of open up the abdomen and then connect these veins by sewing them together so you could relieve the pressure. And that caused a lot of problems and was a big surgery to recover. But the TIPS is a minimally invasive procedure that can be done in good hands in half an hour to 45 minutes and all through a little hole in the neck. And here's a video of a real-time procedure that I'll explain exactly step by step. This procedure is usually done with general anesthesia, although it could in some cases be performed with sedation. So the way it's done is we insert a little tube through the vein. I usually go through the left jugular vein and we navigate down to the liver. And we then use what's called an intravascular ultrasound, which is a little ultrasound machine that we insert in the vein and that allows us to be able to see these blood vessels. And by using that, we can introduce a needle directly through the liver parenchyma into the part of vein. And once we're able to do that, we can then dilate the parenchyma and then insert this little stent that will cause the connection between the part of vein and the hepatic vein. After the procedure, the patient goes to the recovery room for about an hour. And some patients can go home the same day, but most patients stay in the hospital overnight and will repeat the laboratory tests, including the liver function tests and ammonia the next day to make sure everything is working properly. Most of the time, if you have fluid buildup, we'll remove all the fluid at the same time that we do the tips. So hopefully after the procedure, the fluid will not build up anymore. Overall, the procedure itself is very safe and it's very rare to have a complication directly related to the procedure, like bleeding or infection or anything like that. And short term, the patients do really well. 
Sometimes a TIPS procedure can be done as an emergency in the middle of the night if somebody is actually really bleeding through these viruses. And in those cases, we have to be really fast. Now, the main complications of the TIPS are what I mentioned before, the encephalopathy. And that usually happens after a few days. And we can monitor some parameters like the ammonia, like I mentioned before, and the liver tests. But it's usually very important to have a caregiver or a family member around for the first week after the procedure to make sure that you're overall doing okay. And to notice early signs of encephalopathy, like early confusion or things like that. So how can we mitigate the risk of encephalopathy? So like I mentioned before, the encephalopathy is directly related to the size of the shunt. So it's actually the percentage of the blood that is going through the shunt rather than being filtered by the liver. So we want still the blood to be filtered by the liver, but the excess pressure to be filtered by the shunt. And it's not super easy to do that. And sometimes, or most of the time, actually can require some tweaking. And how do we do that? So I tend to start with a, what's called a small caliber tips. So a large tips would be a tips of about 10 to 12 millimeters, a shunt of 12, 10 to 12 millimeters. Obviously, if somebody is bleeding to death, we're gonna put a large shunt right away to make sure they stop bleeding and we can save their life and then we'll deal with the complications afterwards. But somebody that is stable and has, for example, just ascites or recurrent non-life-threatening bleeding will start slower. And the way that we do that is we may start with a five, a six or a seven millimeter tips and we can calibrate by creating a constriction in the middle of the tips. And we do that with some special types of balloon expandable stents that can allow us to be very precise. Now, the downside of doing a small caliber tips is that it may not work right away. And you may require a second procedure, which is a, really a very easy procedure, like a five, 10 minute procedure, where we go in again through the same vein in the neck and open up the tips a little bit with another balloon. But usually after then some time, we can find the balance where we can take care of the ascites, but avoid the encephalopathy. Now, sometimes we may only be able to improve the ascites. So instead of having fluid removed every week, we'll remove the fluid every couple of months, which is just a huge improvement in quality of life. Also, you have to remember that doing repeat paracentesis has its own risks, including bleeding. Because if you do that a hundred times, even if the risk is 1%, that significantly increases the risk of bleeding. But also when you remove large amounts of fluid from the abdomen, you're also removing protein and nutrients. And over time, can cause problems as well. Also, when you remove large amounts of fluid, people may not feel good for a couple of days and that can be a problem as well. And there are some patients that cannot tolerate any fluid removal because they have low blood pressure and the blood pressure may go down after removing the fluid. We do give all women after we remove fluid, but it, even then the blood pressure can be a problem. Now, what do we do if a patient develops encephalopathy after placement of the tips? And that's a great question. And there are things we can do. So first, we obviously optimize the medications for encephalopathy, including the lactulose and rifaximin. We need to make sure you're not constipated because if you're constipated, your body keeps absorbing these toxins that keep increasing the encephalopathy. And some of the toxins are produced from bacteria in the gut, and that's why mild antibiotics like rifaximin may help with the encephalopathy. Now, if the medical treatment doesn't work and you continue to be a little bit confused, then we'll have to decrease the size of the tips. And we can easily do that these days. We have the technology and it's actually a pretty simple procedure that only takes a few minutes to do as well. And we can decrease to whatever size we want. And that tends to help with encephalopathy, but the ascites could come back and may require some more tweaking. But we'll work with you on that. Now, in some rare situations, if even decreasing the tips doesn't help, or your liver really turns a turn for the worse, we may need to close the tips. And the way we close the tips is also we go through the same vein with a little catheter. It's very simple. And we have these plugs that we can use to plug the tips. And we put the plug in and later, if we want to open the tips for any reason because you start bleeding or there's other problems, we can go in and remove that plug very easily as well. After the tips, you still need regular follow-up with your interventional radiologist to monitor the stent and your overall health and liver function. And the follow-up will likely include some imaging studies to make sure the tips is open and blood tests, including the liver function tests and ammonia levels. It's also very important to stick to a liver friendly lifestyle, like avoiding alcohol and eating a balanced diet and taking all your medications as prescribed. 
Although we hope to actually go off the diuretics at some point, we don't stop them cold turkey and we continue the diuretics after the tips and then slowly taper them now. I know liver disease, and especially undergoing a procedure like a TIPS, can feel overwhelming. But the TIPS, I can tell you, it's a powerful tool that can make a big difference in managing the complications of liver disease. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns, talk to your hepatologist or your liver doctor, and also you can call our office and we'll be happy to talk to you about it.